You know, and I guess you could say also this is a, a participation Sunday because uh, a varied audience followed Jesus. They participated in his uh, entrance into Jerusalem, and so shall we, thanks to modern technology. How many have their cell phones? Raise them high. And I'm sure that as you have your cell phones, uh, you are able to text, right? Because you were cool. <laughs> You're with it. As we say, right on. Is that what we... So have them ready because we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask you to use them in just a moment. Let us pray. Lord our God, we give you thanks for uh, all these ways of tuning into your spirit and the uh, spirit of this day. Thank you. And would you please move your spirit into the words about to be spoken and heard, into that which will be thought and felt, so that in all ways we honor the living Christ who rides into our lives this very day. Amen. Okay, here is a trivia question. First, please listen carefully to this music. Now, get those cell phones ready, get ready to text, because I want you to be able to text the correct answer to what movie was that music taken from? Was it A, A Fistful of Dollars, B, A Few Dollars More, C, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, D, It Doesn't Matter. <laughs> so you can text A, B, C, or D to 62953. And as you make your conscientious choices, let me tell you that those three movies, A, B, and C, are part of a, a, a trilogy called the Spaghetti Westerns of the 1960s. They were called the Spaghetti Westerns because they were low-budget Westerns filmed in Italy, and you would not necessarily know that they were uh, from Italy except for two things. One, when the actors talked and the English you heard, they didn't jive. And in the credits at the very end, you would see that the, uh, the character of Ringo was played by Giuseppe Marconi or something. You know what I mean? These spaghetti westerns are most famous for, wow, look at how many people got it wrong. Ah, okay, more people are getting the correct answer, I see. They are most famous for uh, propelling an unknown, relatively unknown American actor named Clint Eastwood, of course, into international superstardom because Clint played the feared man with no name in these westerns. He was always the good guy, always the good guy, this man with no name. And I tried to fool you, but the majority of you, of course, are very right on target. That movie uh, was the good, the bad, and the ugly. But actually, folks, we would have taken num or letter D. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter because all those movies had the same theme. You know, at the very end of the movie, it's something like this. It's high noon in a western town. There stands a man who has done unspeakable wrong, horrific evil, and behind him are his henchmen, all dressed in black as well, looking almost as insidious as this evil demonic man. On the other hand, there's the man with no name, tall, lean, staring through steely gray, unblinking eyes at this facade of evil, protruding from one side at one corner of his mouth, a slender cigar with the lip curled over it in a self-righteous frown. The music builds to a crescendo. Good against evil. Finally, the bad guy cannot take it anymore. Sweat breaks upon his brow. He draws 
But he and his henchmen are no match for the speed, accuracy, and vengeance of the man with no name. <laughs> Have you ever noticed in those westerns that the bad guys are always bad shots? <laughs> there could be 30 of them against Clint, all with their you know, rifles, and then the second shooting starts, you know, they can never hit Clint, but with one six gun, he dispatches them, you know? Now, I, I, I set this up with this uh, Hollywood uh, shtick, if you will, and that Hollywood ending to set up another showdown that was real, and it was not with an imaginary uh, Hollywood character, but it was with a real flesh and blood person. Watch this showdown. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the Passover festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Praise God. God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and rode on it, just as the scripture says. Do not be afraid, city of Zion. Here comes your king, riding on a young donkey. His disciples did not understand this at the time. But when Jesus had been raised to glory, they remembered that the scripture said this about him and that they had done this for him. The people who had been with Jesus when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from death had reported what had happened. That was why the crowd met him, because they heard he had performed this miracle. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, we are not succeeding at all. Look, the whole world is following him. Now let that scene sink in. Because that showdown makes the showdown in any of those westerns look like a walk in the park. Let's, let's uh, play again, I, I want to put this in the right context. Let's play again a little bit of that clip to the right soundtrack. Now, sure, that might be corny, but that is correct. Because if there had been that movie crew, that's what the music would have been, setting up a cataclysmic showdown. That, like I said, puts the one in any of those spaghetti westerns to shame, like kindergarten, like bad guys meeting Mr. Rogers, you know? Because these men, those uh, three men in black, the Pharisees, well, that's just three of dozens waiting for Jesus inside the walls. And they hated Jesus with a venomous passion. You heard what one of them said. See, the whole world is following him. And if the whole world was following him, who would follow them? Who would give them praise? Who would uh, do what they say? Who would support them in the lifestyle to which they've become accustomed? Who would bow down to their God, which was a mechanical uh, deity, far removed from the Father Jesus proclaimed. And so, of course, he was a threat. And perhaps they had heard that Jesus was coming, and maybe they had started making their preparations as to how to deal with this pseudo-Messiah. After all, these religious authorities had the ear of the Roman authorities, and they had access to soldiers, Roman soldiers, men who were quite well-trained in the skill of violence, uh, very adept with whips and chains and nails and hammers and crosses. 
And so they were ready for this Messiah coming in as a threat. But then they see him. And he is not riding on a stallion like one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. He's on a donkey. He's not a man with no name. He's Jesus, son of a carpenter from a little village of Nazareth. He is not carrying a six gun. He is carrying a walking stick and a palm branch. He does not have in his, uh, in his uh, wake the uh, Seventh Cavalry or Navy Seals or Green Berets. No, he has a ragtag group of children and women and uh, starry-eyed ex-fishermen. Ah, those men, as they see Jesus enter and as they reflect uh, in the days to come about this threat, they must have said to themselves, oh, this is going to be easy. Yeah, this is going to be a piece of cake. Maybe easy for them, maybe a piece of cake for them, but not for Jesus. Because Jesus, as you will call, predicted what was going to happen. He said, when I enter into this den of my enemies, one of my friends will betray me. All my friends, the other friends, will desert me. I'm going to be whipped and beaten and hung on a cross. And the cheers we hear today will be the jeers that I hear on Friday. So he knew what was awaiting him. You talk about courage. You talk about real courage to get on that donkey and go and know what's going to happen to him? And I cannot help but to think, as he's walking, or as he is riding his donkey into that den of the, the people with the deep voices dressed in black, I cannot help but to think that perhaps, maybe, he started having second thoughts. I would have. How much easier it would have been to turn that donkey around go back into the hill country, the high country, well away from those uh, venomous enemies of his, go back to uh, picnics and go back to campfires and go back to fishing, go back to uh, prayerful devotions in the hills of Galilee. Yeah, that's it. But had Jesus had such second thoughts, what would have stopped it would have been this. As he's riding, he would have looked around and he would have seen the face of, faces of the children laughing and, and dancing and just delighted to be in his presence. And he would have looked into the faces of women who in his day were treated like property, but he had treated them with dignity and respect. He would have looked into the faces of his disciples, men who had left everything to follow him. He would have looked into the faces of ex-lepers, people who kept their distance from him or from them, but yet he would have touched them. He would have looked into the faces of the ex-tax collectors, ex-prostitutes, ex-sinners, outcasts of society, but he had shown them compassion and grace and given them a second chance. And he would have looked into all of these faces had Jesus had second thoughts. He would have looked into all of their faces and knew right then and there that he had to continue. Because the showdown in Jerusalem would be the telling tale. How it played out would determine whether what Jesus had said was the truth or a pipe dream. How it played out in Jerusalem would determine whether the kingdom of this world fueled by power and greed would win or the kingdom of his father where the meek will inherit the earth and where peacemakers are exalted, whether that kingdom would win. This was a showdown, truly, to determine if Jesus was who he said he was and the kingdom is what he proclaimed it would be. Everything was riding on this showdown as he rode that donkey. So I really think that in addition to this week being called Holy Week, we should call this Showdown Week. Showdown Week. And with all of the, the hymns and the beautiful music we hear, 
Just remember the little uh, good, bad, the ugly thing. How everything was riding on that donkey into the gates of that city. So I want to ask you, having built this up as a cataclysmic showdown, what do you think, with those odds stacked against him, did Jesus win? Did he win? And it's a piece of cake for us to jump seven days ahead and remember that we're going to be singing Christ the Lord is Risen today with great fanfare next Sunday. But don't go to next Sunday yet. Go to this afternoon and tomorrow and the next day and the next day as Jesus continues this showdown and as the gathering dark clouds start to thunder and lightning over him. Does Jesus really win? And I would like you to, to think about that as you live out these next days. Especially ask yourself, did Jesus win? And try to find an answer if you are faced with a showdown in the next day or two or, or so. Are you going to be faced with some decision as to whether to stand up for your faith or run away from it? Ask yourself if Jesus won when you're at the office and you know that you're being presented with an opportunity to do something that's unethical against your faith and yet you feel compelled to do it to keep your job or to get that promotion. Did Jesus win as you consider what you're going to do? Did Jesus win? Ask yourself that when you're in school and your friends are pushing you to do something against what you believe and they're going to take away their friendship from you if you don't do what they want you to do. Ask yourself if Jesus won when you are at play and someone makes a racial slur. Ask yourself if Jesus won when, you're, when you bump into an enemy of yours and instantly you want to pay back and, and feel like you need to get even. Ask yourself if Jesus won when you're in your living room debating whether to bring up a very touchy, very controversial subject, but you know that the, the family needs to deal with it. Ask yourself in those situations if Jesus won. Because it's one thing to believe in your head that he did and sing the hymns, but it's another thing to experience the answer to that question. One woman experienced the answer in a very dramatic fashion. Her name was Carol Kyendall, and she had a best friend by the name of Lois. Lois was diagnosed with a terminal disease, and a few weeks before Lois died, she asked her friend Carol to say the eulogy. Well, that's the last thing Carol wanted to do, but she finally agreed because it was her friend. So Carol started taking notes in the last weeks of uh, Lois's life, notes about what Lois said or did or how she expressed her feelings. After she died, Carol assembled all these notes on a, on a table, and here are her words. I saw a pattern clear, tangible evidence of how God gave Lois the strength to meet her challenges. The strength came not before, but when she got to them. She feared losing her hair, but when she got to that point, she teased about all the dramatic looks she could create with her new wigs. She worried about growing weak and staying in bed, but when that time came, she seemed thankful and content. And when she neared the end of her struggle, she grew more and more peaceful about letting go of life here and looking forward to life in heaven. God transformed her fears into strength, one step at a time, just as he did with Jesus in Gethsemane. You see, courage is getting on that donkey and riding to your Jerusalem. Courage isn't courage if you know the outcome. That's logic. Courage is courage, though, when you get on that donkey and you ride into Jerusalem, trusting that strength will come at the right time, as it did for Lois. Courage is when you saddle up that donkey, you start riding, and you hear hoofbeats next to you because Jesus did win. 
And because he won, he will be with you to make sure that you will win too. That's the gospel of showdown week. Now I started this sermon with a trivia question. I'm going to end with one, but don't take out your cell phones. What does the word Hosanna mean? Well, if you've been through enough Palm Sundays, you know that Hosanna literally means, oh, save us, Lord, save us. Well, friends, that's what Jesus did, and that's what Jesus does. Whenever you saddle up and ride to your Jerusalem, you will see that for yourself.